Yeah, hello everybody. Thank you for attending my talk. Um, I try to be not in front of the screen. Um, yeah, the talk will be about the rendering technology of Lords of the Fallen. Um, as you can think of, um, this is a very large topic. I try to focus on um, a few different things and will you tell you uh, about a, a few general things about our game. <clears throat> so um, first to us, our developer, it's uh, Deck 13 Interactive. This is most uh, one of the um, leading game developers, as you can say, in Germany. Um, we are building our own in-house technology um, called Fledge. Uh, it's currently working on the PS4, the Xbox One, PC. We have also an iOS uh, port um, and we have an older render system in, on PS3 and Xbox 360. But currently the next gen and PC uh, systems are our focus. Maybe you know us uh, from previous projects like Venetica, Jack Keen or Blood Knights. Pretty much smaller projects um, and Lords of the Fallen is currently our largest project we are doing so far. So Lords of the Fallen, uh, maybe if no, uh, you already know of it, um, it's a third person challenging action RPG. Uh, Tomasz Gop talked about it uh, tomorrow at 10 I think and showed you some, uh, sh some, some in-game scenes. Um, yeah, it's developed for next-gen consoles and PC, and we are developing it together with the um, uh, Polish company CI Games, and the release is scheduled for the end of 2014. The development of uh, Lords of the Fallen, it started um, as a PS3 and an Xbox 360 project, I think two or three years ago in the pl first planning phase, so we are Quite, we are developing uh, quite fast uh, quite for a quite long time on this title um, because, yeah, at the beginning, especially the technology question wasn't solved at all. So, um, yeah, we gradually shifted then to the back then next gen. So we decided to go to PS4 and, uh, and Xbox One. Uh, so we had a lot of changes in content. And um, as you can imagine, changes in content uh, means usually a lot of changes in tech. Um, first of all, yeah, we had a lot of stuff, but on the rendering side, we noticed that um, our old light prepass renderer wasn't that much uh, suited for the for the new generation. So we switched to more traditional deferred rendering. This will be mon one uh, major topic of this uh, presentation. Uh, we also dropped the the Xbox, uh, not Xbox, the DX9 support, um, which unlocked a lot of freedom. So we could do a lot of more stuff without taking care of um, yeah older rendering APIs. Um, and we had to, uh, to, to use a lot of more uh, multi-threading because the new consoles, they have a lot of cores, but a single one is uh, much slower than, than uh, on PC. And of course, we have a lot of more objects, dynamic objects, physics simulations, everything, and uh, yeah, we had to address this. Okay, an overview. First, I will um, present you our own deferred rendering approach. Then I will talk about deferred material parameter buffers. Uh, I come back to this later. Um, then I will tell a little bit about deferred particle lighting. And uh, if we have time left, I will show you some minor things uh, like transparent shadows, volumetric lighting. Volumetric lighting, the details of that talk you can find hopefully on the website of Digital Dragons. This was the talk yesterday from my colleague Benjamin. Um, and maybe a little bit about uh, GPU particles, but this is just a teaser and not uh, the main focus. Um, yeah, our switch. Um, what was it all about? Um, who's, who's using deferred rendering here in the audience? Not that much, but a few, okay. Maybe then you ask yourself the same question, what, what to do, which approach uh, shall we go? Shall we go a more traditional thing where we render all the objects once to, to a larger G-buffer or should we um, render a very, very small G-buffer and render again after that the, the whole geometry again to apply materials and stuff? So we did the latter approach uh, for the last generation because um, of yeah, memory bandwidth constraints from the, from, the, from the old consoles and we didn't have that much content, that much uh, polygons and stuff like that. So yeah, we tried to port that straight forward to the new consoles and we noticed that we had a lot of overhead for geometry, say number of polygons, API calls, whatever. Um, and on the opposite, the, the memory amount um, and the, the bandwidth is very good nowadays so on the piece four you have to fast DDR5 memory so this is um, not that much of a problem anymore and we can allocate a lot more render target memory stuff like that. 
Um, the one major thing we had to do is uh, because we, we lost our material stage, so we had to do a lot of effects and material stuff in a deferred rendering pass, so in full screen pass instead of uh, forward rendering style pass. So this is also what I will reflect here. Yeah, examples are reflections and fog, which were um, previously applied uh, as an, yeah directly in the object shader in the material pa um, in the material stage. And right now we have to address that uh, as a full screen pass. Uh, additionally, we wanted to have more freedom in lighting. So it wasn't just an optimization step. It was also uh, we want to have more of everything. So um, we thought about an image-based lighting approach using localized cube maps for um, ambient specular lighting. So that's basically what the most people are doing right now. So yeah, building cube maps, blurring them down, and then parallax correct them and yeah, apply the reflection. Uh, translucency was um, a big wish uh, of our artists that translucency should not be in hacky corner case, which was, yeah, we did this as a corner case before and right now it's fully integrated into the lighting so you can basically have every object uh, translucent so that light filtering it through the, the object and uh, you don't have any performance penalties or something like that. Um, next thing was transparent objects. So translucency and transparency is still a difference. Translucency is still a, a solid object where just light is bleeding through from the from behind, and the transparent objects have still the same problems as before. So we thought about how we can uh, integrate transparent object more and more into uh, our scene so that it receives lighting, receives shadow, casts shadows, stuff like that. Um, and dynamic global illumination was a big wish for the. Yeah. Next generation graphics would say, and for that we are using uh, directional irradiance light maps from uh, Geomerics and Lighten. It's a middleware you can buy, and it generates light maps for you. So, go straight to the tech. Um, in a general overview, what we are doing, these are the rendering passes. So um, first we render, as usual, in a default rendering approach, we render a, a G-buffer. In our case, it's um, minimal. Um, we try not to render too much stuff uh, into uh, MRTs. So currently we have uh, two 32-bit uh, render targets plus the depth buffer and plus uh, our 11, 11, 10 uh, HDR capable texture for um, the diffuse, uh, the indirect diffuse lighting from Enlighten. It's also part of the G buffer. After that, we render the L buffer, the light buffer, we render the lighting to two different 32-bit textures, three channel, for separate diffuse and specular lighting. Um, after that, we apply reflections um, in a full screen pass, basically. Um, and after that, we render one combined pass where we combine everything. So we combine the textures in the G buffer, the lighting, the reflections, Stuff like that. Um, and after that, we render transparency object, then uh, the fog as an additional uh, full screen pass, and after that, post processing. In between, there's a lot of other things going on, like subsurface scattering, stuff like that, but it's uh, not the main topic today. G buffer layout. How do we build up our G buffer? Um, we thought about. Um, what should be in there, uh, what, sh what should be the, the minimum set of features we, we put into the G-Buffer, and we thought it should be still as small as possible because we have nothing to, to waste. So um, there are a lot of stuff to, um, to think about, like parameter encoding. We tried to encode certain uh, attributes to, um, to save channels. So normally you need for normal, you need three channels. Uh, there are better encoding schemes where you can put them in two channels. The same we did with uh, albedo and, and specular color. We encoded them in a compact YCOCG uh, compression scheme. You can read how it's done there. So it's uh, basically this compression scheme is a, uh, the the Y is a, a, the Luma component, which is uh, which is stored at high frequency, so every pixel. And we have the orange and the green difference chroma, and these chroma components are stored in an interleaved stipple checkerboard pattern. Um, so we store it basically in low resolution, but later on nobody will notice because the eye is more sensitive to luminance. Parameter packing was another thing. Um, we don't dedicate a whole color channel to 
different attributes. We try to, to stick single bits into, uh, into certain channels. And we tried to share channels for parameters which are mutually exclusive. Uh, in our case, that was uh, translucency and color specular, because you never have translucency and color specular all together, so we can share it. Material ID and then index. Um, this is very important for referencing per material parameters. We'll talk about this later. And all in all, we have uh, 128 bits per pixel on 1080p. This is uh, on 1080p. This is uh, nearly 32 megabytes. So our debuffer fits completely into Xbox One ES RAM, which was an uh, important point for us because the ordinary DDR3 speed of the Xbox One isn't that fast. So straight to the point. Uh, this is the table uh, how our debuffer looks like. So. This one talked about is the encoded normal. We have a material ID and index. We'll talk about this later. The specular exponent, pretty standard. Um, in the second row, you have, uh, we have the albedo luma, the albedo chroma, the specular luma, and the specular chroma shared with translucency. And as I said, um, these are mutually exclusive. And we decide which parameter is packed into that, that channel by evaluating the material ID. And the material ID is basically one bit. So the one and only bit uh, inside the material ID uh, determines whether what's inside there. So if it's chroma or is it translucency. And the remaining seven bits are used to reference material parameter buffers as an index. And here you have some code how to, to unpack the single bit and to unpack the remaining seven bits. So basically, this looks like this. So our debuffer is, um, yeah, you have, you can't really see what's going on there if you see, uh, if you look at all the three channels all together, you have to split them into the data channels and then, then you can see what's going on there. Stencil buffer is also used quite a lot. So we fill up the stencil buffer during the debuffer stage to um, mask out certain effects later on, like decals, uh, reflections, or skin shading. And two bits are reserved for the, uh, the light volume stenciling. So we have a, a two-sided stencil approach for, for culling uh, lights. And that's what it's used for. Other attributes we also have for certain effects. Could just skim through it. So we have, uh, for example, tangents for smooth alpha test objects, per object, rim lights, glows, other FX. This is, everything is rendered after the G-buffer or after the lighting, after the combined pass. Uh, for example, also motion vectors. We don't render motion vectors for all the objects, but only the moving object to re um, objects. The rest is uh, reprojected um, with the camera motion blur scheme. So material parameter buffers. What's, what's it, what is it all about with that? So um, we need uh, usually more material parameters than we have stored in the G-buffer. Um, and what are we doing when the debuffer is full, like in our case? So we could go the easy way and just say, yeah, add another 1080p target to the debuffer, but that's uh, usually not, not practicable. Um, not practi practical? <laughs> um, and, and the other way, some information is only needed per material and not necessarily per pixel. So exactly these material parameters like Reflection parameters, reflection strength of certain uh, materials, Fresnel factors, distortion factors, tints of uh, subsurface scattering effects. These are usually stored only per material and not per pixel. And these we want to store in these material parameter buffers. Um, what are we doing? What is a material parameter buffer? Basically, it's a very simple thing. It's um, just a buffer which is generated on the CPU on every frame. So we count or we collect all the materials we use in the frame and build such a buffer out of it. Uh, back in the DirectX 9 days, we just use uh, multiple 1D 32-bit textures. And on DirectX 11, we use structured buffers, which are more performant and simply more handy. Um, and basically, this is a list of parameters. And we store the material parameters there. And we index them later on by the material index, which is stored in the G-buffer. It's seven bits large and can therefore index up to 128 different uh, materials. So 
this allows us a lot of a uh, lot more material variety per pixel without polluting the G buffer. <coughs> Sorry. So one example is um, our translucency solution. This is basically inspired by a solution um, uh, suggested by this guy. He worked at DICE, I think, and um, did this for Battlefield 3 or something. It's, um, I won't go into detail with that, but the, the basic problem with that is you need, um, for example, uh, the color of an object, of the interiors of an object um, that you can um, Mm, colorize the, um, the, the light which is filtering through that object. And basically, since this is a material or a surface property, you have to store it in a G-buffer. Um, in default rendering, we have too many of them. Um, maybe we can also pass these parameters per light or something, but this is not always the way to go. Um, so we only store a single scalar translucency value, which, is, which comes from a texture. But then it doesn't have any color or any other uh, property. So other properties must be stored in these kind of buffers. And you can imagine that like this. So we store the material ID in the G-buffer. And this is basi this basically translated directly to an index in this structured buffer. And then we can query that, uh, these values and use them for computation. So here's a little bit of code. Won't go into detail with that, but I highlighted the, um, the parameters which are per light, which are per pixel. This comes from a texture and is stored in a, in a G-buffer, and the parameters per material. And these mater material parameters are uh, coming from the um, per material parameter buffers. Coming to the lighting, this is um, pretty uh, standard and straightforward, so just skim through it. We have four different light types, the usual one, um, but we have currently um, about 500 lights per levels, which is um, very much. <coughs> so we also have to optimize a lot. Um, the problem also is most of these lights have gobo textures, like you know, projected textures, IES light profiles, and casting shadows, stuff like that, so it's not a cheap thing. Mm -hmm. What we are still doing is a classic light volume accumulation into the L buffer, so we render each light um, with a light volume and add the stuff up. Um, and for large light, we use uh, double-sided stencil masking optimization. Um, Tiles deferred is currently under development, but um, the problems uh, we have with um, uh, projected textures. <laughs> Sorry. One problem of the tiles deferred is that we have uh, too many resources attached to each light. And currently, we have to uh, think about that. So um, this is the L buffer when it comes out of the G buffer. Because I told you, it's, uh, it's also bound to the G buffer because we need to resolve the, the light maps to that L buffer during the G buffer stage. <coughs> so basically, this is um, our indirect lighting. Um, we use light maps for the um, for the static geometry and uh, spherical harmonic light probes for the for the dynamic objects, and we use geomerics and light for that. Um, this is our diffuse L buffer. This is basically generated during the, the light accumulation stage. Um, it just accumulates direct diffuse shadows uh, with shadows and translucent light. This is the uh, specular L buffer. Um, so we store. Um, uh, diffuse and specular lighting separately. Um, before um, we reconstructed the, um, the specular color out of the specular luminance and the diffuse chroma, but this wasn't sufficient enough for us. So with the new Barrix 11 um, pixel formats like that 11, 11, 10, it was uh, pretty practical to, to split them. Uh, this is a reflection buffer. It's not necessarily um, part of the lighting, but still contributes um, indirect specular lighting. So basically this contains static reflections um, and our image-based lighting approach um, is done with uh, localized parallax correct cube maps suggested by this guy. Um, and basically we are doing this with uh, so-called environment probes. These are simple um, objects we place in the level and say how large 
this environment probe is. We take six screenshots from it in, in a raw HDR format, <coughs> put them into um, a tool called CubeMap again, originally from ATI, and um, therefore we have a very, very small HDR um, reflection uh, cube map and we filter them down with edge fix up and stuff like that that we can um, that we can um, index different roughnesses inside yeah so um, basically this is done with using um, one full screen pass we just pass uh, the eight most influential um, environment probes to that pass and uh, add the reflection and the final frame yeah, we composite it with uh, texture colors, volumetric light scattering, and so on. So, next important thing was particle lighting. Um, particles were, when in most game engines, particle lighting is pretty hard um, because Usually you have very dense objects, um, which costs a lot of performance if you light every fragment, because it could be that each pixel has uh, hundreds and thousands of fragments uh, to be lit. Um, and especially in deferred rendering solutions where you use a lot of lights, it's uh, hard to match the look of a deferred lit object with a um, forward lit object. In a forward lit object you normally pass, I don't know, eight the eight nearest light, lights to it, and this can lead to popping and stuff like that. So we wanted to have a fully integrated deferred solution for that, together with shadows, lighting, stuff like this. So this is a little bit uh, programmer art. <coughs> I just set uh, um, a smoke particle here, and it's in shadow, and then it casts into the um, into the lit room, and we want to have effects like this. And if we don't, if we wouldn't have shadows it would completely fell out of the scene. Same with that. So we have one particle effect and it traverses through a room with different lights and then it gets the color of the light. So, yeah, what I said, um, particles are usually transparent, dense, and cause a lot of overdraw, especially if you, if you have the common types like atmospherics, uh, smoke effect, dust effects, stuff like that. Um, so basically these are examples for that. Um, and yeah, this is not very efficient to light per fragment per pixel. So what you're usually doing, even in forward rendering, you light them per, per vertex, because this is really sufficient. And what we are doing is exac exactly the same, but with uh, deferred rendering. So we can use all the lights um, we want to use also on the, on the transparent objects. It's a smoke coming in from the Sausage, sausage uh, stand which dries my throat. So what we are doing with the um, deferred particle lighting, in the first step we're doing basically the same as um, with uh, solid rendering. We render some kind of G-buffer. So we want to store particle properties in a buffer which we evaluate later for lighting. Um, in normal deferred lighting with um, transparent objects, uh, this is usually a screen space buffer, so we render objects directly um, into the screen and rasterize them. In this case, <coughs> this is um, harder to do. So we decided for a sequential list of fragments stored in a, yeah, in a texture. Um, and doing so, we render the particle vertex buffer as a point list. So you can use that primitive, primitive topology in, in DirectX 11, but in OpenGL or something like that, there are similar topologies. So we are using all the vertex buffers subsequent, uh, subsequently into, uh, into that texture. Currently, this is a 16-bit 16, 16 uh, floating point texture, which is not too large. And right now, it's uh, quite sufficient. Uh, currently, the G-buffer only contains vertex positions, and we use them just to see if they are inside the light or outside and apply um, an attenuation function for it. <coughs> you could also think about storing translucency or normals inside, but currently we are using particle lighting only for this kind of atmospheric smoke effects and we don't, they don't really have a normal, so dust particles in the air don't have, don't have a normal. Here's some code for it. Um, just in case you want to implement that at home, 
don't want to go into detail. It's uh, pretty much simple. You just have to compute the the position where um, where the fragment should be rasterized, and to put it into a sequential list, we just have an index, and bring that index into um, the texture space we want to have it. And you have to take account for the vertex ID. If you're using instance um, instance rendering for particles, you also have to take care of the instance ID. Um, and this guy here is a uniform parameter passed to the shader. It's, um, it's the number of particles which were rendered before that we don't overwrite particles in that sequential lists. After that, also similar to normal deferred rendering, we apply lighting. Um, here we can't render um, normal light volumes since the, particle, the particles are not in screen space. <clears throat> here we have to render full screen quads for every light. And we um, also same with normal default rendering, we have different shaders for different light types and we can also support the same properties of the lights, like are they casting shadows, have they protected textures, whatever, it just works. Um, and shadowing is also the same, we just shadow using a, a normal uh, percentage closer filtering. This is just a, a little trick you can do, you can, um, um, you can enlarge the kernel width of the PCF to get less flickering because in some uh, uh, in some conditions you have when um, you have problems if um, one vertex passes inside a shadowed region and outside you get a little bit of popping because you don't have a per pixel frequency so you can accord uh, yeah you can take care of this with a larger kernel and the implementation is pretty trivial trivial after that um, the particles are basically lit, but they are not rendered on screen. And in the end, we just render all the particle buffers again with particle lighting applied. So um, we render basically the particles as usual and uh, sample the previously lit or the previously computed light buffer in the vertex shader by computing the same, the same um, texture coordinates um, based on vertex ID, instance ID, and so on. In this case, you really have to take care that the, the particles are rendered in the same order. If you don't render in the same order, you get maybe the lighting of different particles, and that's, that's basically not good. <coughs> so what's the conclusion about that? We have a uh, uh, pretty, yeah, we have uh, our we have pretty uh, positive conclusion about this. So um, it's great for many types of particles. Fire maybe not because they are self-emitting lights, but especially for, for fog and uh, um, smoke, it's, it's really good because it's cheap and effective. You can use it nearly everywhere without a bigger performance penalty. But it also works best with small particles because since we are lighting uh, on a per vertex frequency, it's, um, it can get problem when you have very large particles and uh, very small lights. And yeah, if a very large particle traverses through a very small and uh, bright light, then you may get, yeah, you may get flickering. Just because it's per vertex lighting. Um, okay, just a smaller topic. Uh, it's about how we implement the transparent shadows and shadows in general. So we are using, uh, for, for our directional main lights, we are using a cascaded shadow mas uh, map approach um, with a single shadow map we, uh, which we reuse for every slice <coughs> and accumulate them into a shadow mask in screen space. Um, then after that we, we blur it with a depth preserving Gauss blur. And this way if we um, if we have monochromatic shadow sources, we can um, accumulate up to four shadow sources. So in our case, it's, uh, we have um, the directional light in one channel and uh, three spotlights in, in the uh, and three remaining channels, and we get um, the screen space blurring for free, basically. But what, 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 what are we doing when we want color transparent shadows? And that's what we wanted. And uh, as usual, we try to, to find a simple approach. So um, we just um, mark uh, the objects 
in the engine which, uh, ca which should cast um, transparent shadows. Um, and we render them alpha blended into a shadow map sized color buffer um, while using the shadow map as a depth buffer. That, that happens right after the, um, generating the shadow map. And usually that's not the whole scene, it's just, just a few objects. I show you a screenshot where this applies very good. <coughs> and later on, um, when we apply the shadow lookup, we just sample that uh, color buffer with the shadow map UB and um, multiply it with the lighting. And this works seamless with volumetric lights, particle lighting, normal lighting, everything. So it's pretty robust. Problem is just that we um, reduce the shadow mask to only one shadow source. That means we lose the, the nice uh, screen space filtering on the, um, on the spotlights, but normally that's not an issue because we can use simple higher PCF uh, kernel sizes for the spotlights. Yeah, self-shadowing is another issue. It's not a perfect technique, but it's simple, effective, and cheap. And that's uh, mostly what, what we want. So these are examples. So this is a simple test scene. Um, these are three spotlights with volumetrics enabled. And um, we configured this material to be transparent. And um, what the algorithm does is basically it first generates the, the shadow depth buffer, which is a normal shadow mask. And then we, um, we have alongside a color buffer with the same size. And we render just certain objects into that while depth testi testing against this, uh, this shadow map. And both textures are bound to the lighting shader and therefore can cast uh, dynamic colored shadows. So you can move the light sources and, or, or the objects and everything is, is just working. So it also works with volumetric lights, as I mentioned. You just take this texture also into account when rendering the volumetrics when doing the ray marching. So pretty straightforward. Um, to the volumetric lighting is just <coughs> because originally I wanted to do uh, just an overview talk of the rendering. Um, then I decided to still go a little bit deeper into um, into different other techniques. So this is it's, this is just a little teaser. If you want to need more detail, uh, watch again Benjamin's talk. Um, so basically, we we are doing this with just ray marching. Uh, um, the screen in lights view space and evaluating the shadow map, the color shadow map, IES profiles, and yeah, volumetric textures for fog effects, everything. So this is based on the research of this guy and with some specialities on our engine. So these are the screenshots. Works pretty nice and solid. He recently uh, also added a temporal reprojection scheme to, um, to further reduce flickering. <clears throat> so this technique is pretty solid, so we can have multiple lights casting shadows in full screen on the PS4 in under one millisecond, which is pretty solid. GPU particles, so everybody have it. So um, right now we have some computer data-based simulations of large um, amounts of particles. We have the usual stuff like uh, screen space collisions, so we test against the, uh, the depth buffer for collisions. We have a lot of emitter types, and so on and so on. Um, we, uh, in parallel to this, we also use um, uh, NVIDIA's APEX, which is a quite more powerful system because it has um, um, real-time simulated uh, turbulence fields. We don't have that, that stuff. It's only for uh, simpler stuff. Um, for this, we use a pre-baked 3D vector fields exported from, from, um, from Maya and other force field types. But yeah, this topic is too large to uh, tackle it in completion now. So just a few screens about that. Uh, and some things for the future. So this is pretty much the end of my presentation. Um, there are Sadly, some things that didn't made it to the engine. One thin, thing we really wanted to have it from, from the beginning was physical-based rendering. We don't have it right now because of several reasons. Um, we have a PBR render path, but um, a lot of content was already done, so we couldn't switch. And um, also the artists were not really pleased by changing the workflow um, in, in full production, so maybe this is 
something for future projects. And what we're also thinking about right now is reintroducing a pure Z prepass. So we first got rid of the second deferred rendering pass. Now we're reintroducing a new one. Uh, we have to see if this um, is really worth it. Um, but I think that it really can reduce further overdraw in a much more complicated gbuffer pass right now. And it also helps with decals because uh, our deferred decal solution is currently uh, not the best and I think it can really help to have um, uh, that layout um, before the gbuffer pass that we can have something like a deferred, deferred gbuffer, uh, decal gbuffer. But it's another topic for the future. Um, and what we want, want, what we want to focus more and more in the future are tools. We noticed that we can have a lot of uh, cool rendering effects, but if the artist cannot use them, they are worthless. So that's one thing we really want to do in the future in new projects: invest more time uh, into tools that the graphics effects can be used uh, in a better way. And basically, that's a rough outline of uh, the rendering technology of Lords of the Fall. And thanks for listening. And I want to thank the amazing Deck 13 team. It's, uh, of course, not uh, everything is my work. It's, uh, it's the work of the whole uh, team at Deck 13. Uh, we still have some time for questions, so if anyone would like to ask. Uh, hello there. Uh, there was one thing that I think uh, was on the slides, but you haven't really commented on it. Uh, you said you have written uh, that you are currently researching a tiled-based approach for deferred rendering. Can you share any initial thoughts, maybe results? Is it efficient? Um, yeah, we have a, a compute shader based um, uh, support for um, tiled deferred, but it's only a prototype right now. Uh, it works pretty solid with um, lots of simple lights, like point and spot lights without any uh, resources attached. So this is pretty, this is really uh, faster than rendering each uh, object after, after and after again. But um, currently we have problems because our artists have uh, projected textures, IES profiles, and other stuff attached to, this, um, to these lights. And this is currently a problem. So we're currently thinking about um, building an atlas of um, projected textures for, for each level, and use that and store an index for, for each light, which, um, uh, which tile in the atlas to use. But then we also have to pass uh, projection matrices UV transformation, everything to each tiled deferred light. So this this is currently under construction. Uh, also a second question. Uh, so I guess you are right now rendering uh, light volumes, uh, but are you using actual uh, fully fledged meshes uh, like triangulized spheres or cones, or are yes. the and have you tested uh, screen space quads? Uh, yeah, we tested it and we had it this way in our um, previous engine on the Xbox 360 because we had problems with um, predicated tiling and uh, EDRAM. Uh, we tested that and it works well, but you lose um, or you, you are forced to use uh, uh, double-sided stencil masking before. Because if you use full screen quads uh, naively for every light, then yeah, cost will explode. Yeah. So you have to, to render all the lights. Uh, you, you first need to render the, um, the, the stencil mask and then uh, render the full screen quad. Is that what you mean? Uh, I didn't mean a full screen quad. I thought of, a, let's say, a projection of a AABB into a screen space quad. So it doesn't cover the whole screen, but just the area that the lights affects in the screen space. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we didn't try that, uh, but it would be surely pos possible. Right. All right, thanks. But like I said, for, for large lights, we really benefit from rendering the light volume twice. First, with a stencil only pass, and second, with the, the actual light shader. And this, this is a benefit we won't lose, right? uh, we don't want to lose right now. Uh, just a curious uh, what is your approach in uh, GPU uh, sh um, 
In GPU particles, is it uh, based on a compute shader, transfer feedback on something like CUDA? Uh, no, it's pure compute shader, um, and it's a position-based approach. Yeah. Um, uh, well, uh, are you just uh, putting uh, data into a buffer and uh, compute this with shader, right? All right, it's completely done on the GPU. Um, but I'm not really an expert in this field. This was just uh, uh, this was just a, a teaser for it. But it's it's completely on the GPU, used uh, with compute shaders. We're currently testing it on consoles, but I don't know if if that is um, if it if it will work. It's just an experimentation. This was just a, a glimpse into the future. What we are currently doing now. So, what we are use what we are using in real production currently is, is Nvidia's Apex, which is working really solid. Um, yeah, this is just research in some other direction. Just a research, a research to be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I really liked your uh, particle per vertex lightning, uh, and I have a question about sorting the particles. Do you do you do it on the CPU before rendering the first buffer? Or have you tried sorting it uh, on the GPU side? Um, you have to sort it on the CPU side if you want to light it, because um, as I said, you have two passes. You have first the gbuffer pass, and then you have the, the actual render pass. And the, the order of the draw calls have to be the same. They must be the same. Uh, therefore, you have to, to sort the render queues on a per particle system or particle emitter uh, level before on the CPU. But um, this is just a rough sorting that we have the same order. Um, if you mean things like order independent transparency, is that maybe what you want? No. We are investigating also in this, but um, that's that's only a rendering thing that we that we don't that we don't get wrong ordering inside the particle system. But the the particle system, the particle systems itself must be in our case must be uh, sorted on the uh, CPU that we that we have the yeah the same order in the two passes <laughs>